Coming up next. Stay tuned to learn more about the state of the art in blockchain and cryptocurrency technology. Reimagine 2020. Welcome to, uh, to our panel on uh, interoperability in uh, DeFi. Uh, I'm Arthur, uh, one of the co-founders and CEO of uh, Multi, which is a margin-first uh, crypto exchange uh, focused on altcoins. So what we do is we offer uh, spot trading, margin trading, as well as peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, for various altcoins. And uh, today's topic is, uh, as I mentioned, interoper interoperability in DeFi or decentralized finance. And uh, I'm very excited because we have three amazing projects here on the forefront of it. So looking forward to having uh, some fruitful discussions and learning from the actual uh, builders for once, not just the uh, influencers and uh, sort of opinion holders. So um, without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over uh, to them. So uh, how, do, how about we start with uh, Dennis? Yeah, uh, so just uh, uh, introduce uh, yourself and your projects a bit and uh, uh, and we'll kick it off. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dennis. I'm the head of ecosystem growth at Kyber Network. And in case you haven't heard of uh, Kyber Network, it's just like uh, on-chain liquidity protocol that aggregates liquidity from many different kinds of reserves. And it kind of feeds that downstream to dozens, almost a hundred different dApps and wallets and DeFi um, financial primitive. So basically Kyber just allows one token to be swapped to another token across almost any stream of the Ethereum ecosystem, just like connecting exchanges and Uniswap Bank or they're all plugged into Kyber. We have professional market managers, they provide liquidity and that gets pushed down to this whole ecosystem that needs one currency converted to the other. And personally, I've been involved in this space since 2016. I came across Ethereum first and I've been in love with it like ever since then. And that's been my primary focus. Got it. Uh, JP, your turn. Hey all, uh, I'm one of the researchers for ThorChain and I've been in the Bitcoin space since 2013. And in 2017 started uh, playing around with Ethereum uh, and there's some decentralized applications on, on Ethereum. Um, I help the ThorChain team in researching uh, and building a decentralized liquidity network. ThorChain is an ability to, well, it's, it's a blockchain that connects to other chains by simply observing them. So instead of having a hard security connection whereby signatures from one chain are directly converted into another chain and, and proved, uh, ThorChain has soft connections. So it simply observes events occurring on other chains and seeks for all its nodes to come to consensus about those events in order to then perform state changes. And those state changes uh, are simple. They're just simply swapping of assets uh, and provision of liquidity in liquidity pools. So you can basically call ThorChain a cross-chain Uniswap. Uh, the final uh, piece of the puzzle is redeeming assets. So ThorChain does not have any pegged or wrapped tokens. Because of its connections with uh, other chains on the layer one level, it's able to redeem layer one assets. So you can send in Bitcoin on layer one to swap and redeem it for Ethereum, basically as fast as the transactions are, are observed and confirmed, which is around uh, five seconds for ThorChain's block speed and the confirmation speeds on the external chains. Um, the, the last secret is its threshold signature scheme, which is chain agnostic. And it doesn't matter which chain it is, could be Bitcoin, Ethereum, Binance Chain, Monero, uh, ThorChain can connect to them all. So that's ThorChain in a nutshell. You can call it a cross-chain Uniswap and the team are looking forward to launching it this year. Just a quick question, sorry. When you mean it's like Uniswap, is it based like an automated market maker for its price discovery? That's correct. Though we don't like to call it automated market making because there's nothing automated about it. The pools don't change 
unless people poke those pools uh, to swap assets and arbitrage across those pools. Rather, you can call them, and the team likes to call them, incentivized liquidity pools. They're incentivized because they pay out both emission and rewards based on liquidity fees. So people who are looking to move their assets into productivity will seek to place them in liquidity pools because they can basically make their Bitcoin work for them, make the Ethereum work for them, where currently those assets today are not productive. Uh, and they are liquidity pools in the sense that they require active management. Uh, liquidity pools are persistent economic bounties to restore the pool pricing to the correct market price. But that correct market price is entirely dependent on the information propagation speed of the market and the market participants. So chain, ThorChain does not have any opinion on price and all pricing is actually internal. So I can do some cool things. Nice. Very exciting. Uh, let's uh, finish the answers with, uh, we've got Michael from, uh, from Ren. Hey guys, uh, this is Michael Burgess, uh, head of operations at REN. Um, yeah, just a quick overview of RENVM. I mean, the easiest way to think about it is, I mean, our, our core goal is bringing interoperability to DeFi. And then the way we do that is um, really think of RENVM as a, de a decentralized custodian. So it takes custody of an asset, emits a, a Ethereum representation, um, and it does that fluidly. So you just, you know, you send a Bitcoin and then it spits out an ERC-20 on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and that is kind of generic. It, it applies to all blockchains. Um, so that's that's really what we're working on and happy to explain more detail. But uh, but yeah, we're, we're shooting for mainnet here in the next uh, couple of weeks. So we're pretty excited. Thanks, guys. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, definitely it seems to be incredibly uh, exciting times for, uh, for DeFi generally. And um, I think this has been said maybe before or probably uh, the previous years as well, but 2020 might prove to be the sort of uh, year of DeFi. Because uh, so, uh, but so let's uh, let's kick off uh, to us. So we have a couple of talking points as well as some uh, QA questions from uh, from your communities as well as some uh, cross community uh, questions uh, as well. So the first topic is um, is uh, so the main sort of the most attractive part of uh, why or why this interoperability is being chased is uh, is bringing Bitcoin to uh, to DeFi. But what, what do you guys see as, how will it sort of, because uh, this would technically, you know, it would it would extend the uh, the addressable market by, by by orders of magnitude almost. So uh, how is it, what are these sort of, what are the other uh, implications of this uh, that, that, that you see and sort of how, how, do, how would you say, will this change uh, the DeFi ecosystem, let's say like a year from now, assuming that, you know, all of, uh, so everyone launches their, uh, their main nets and Kyber completes their, their protocol upgrades and uh, what will things uh, look like a year from now? Um, maybe I can just kick off and uh, I mean uh, Bitcoin I think Bitcoin is is amazing as a store of value in the way it's come through these years but I mean because of it because of the limitations within the script language it's so hard to do anything slightly more complex than basically hold an exchange so the growth of DeFi and bringing like a margin trading and lending and borrowing onto a decentralized platform means that now it's time to come and like bring that value that's in Bitcoin and kind of allow it to be act as a financial instrument where it can be used within DeFi because we build all the piping and it looks amazing and we have all these different assets being swapped and collateralized and insured and there's so much going on here that it's a shame that you know Bitcoin isn't represented if, if there wasn't interoperability which is why I'm really excited to see that finally we can bring in that value and it will, I think, help the growth of DeFi as well, because at the end of the day, Bitcoin's market cap is over 10 times Ethereum. So there's a lot of value stored in there. And I see that as a way of flowing that value into Ethereum and also bringing in eyeballs and interest from that space as well. Got it. Got it. Anything else uh, you guys, uh, you guys uh, have to add to that? Yeah, I definitely yeah. know um, what, what Dennis said. I mean, really, it's, it's a fresh infusion of liquidity into the DeFi ecosystem. So it'll really extend the lead that Ethereum already has. Uh, I think that, that's fairly obvious. I mean, you know, it's fairly, it's fairly simple, but, uh, you know, think of DeFi as a balloon, right? And by allowing Bitcoin in, you're just blowing more air into it. 
Um, so you're, you're, you're really just expanding uh, its overall use case. So it's something we're definitely excited about as well. So 11 years ago, Satoshi Nakamoto launched a, the first decentralized trustless digital asset. The problem is we've never had a way to exchange that asset with similar characteristics of trustlessness and decentralization. We've had basically exchanges run rampant, which are glorified MySQL databases with IOU tokens and dudes running around with two out of three multi-sigs and calling that a day, which is basically BitMEX's security model right now. And we have exchanges like Binance with, with potentially tens of thousands of Bitcoin in completely um, unaudited, uh, non-transparent uh, methods of custody. So we've, we've enjoyed trusts digital assets for 11 years. It's time to uh, bring, bring those same characteristics to exchanging them. And that's what ThorChain is. It's not about, for, for the team's point of view, it's not about bringing Bitcoin to DeFi. It's bringing DeFi instead to Bitcoin. Because as everyone's pointed out, that's where the bulk of the value is stored uh, because of Bitcoin's first mover and its laser focus on auditability and monetary sovereignty. So we need to solve, and we're very close to solving uh, RenVM with the Triple uh, S uh, with no trusted dealer scheme is exciting. Looking forward to that being open source. Um, and but the main and there's also a new updated thresh signature scheme that's just about to come out. It's a single round TSS, which is which is going to be the new frontier, because with a single round TSS, you can basically make it asynchronous and you can increase your participation set from 12. Um, the maximum uh, signatures you can have in a Bitcoin multisig is 20, but single round TSS means you can basically have an async threshold signature that goes 30, 60, 100 participants. Um, so you can really increase that, increase the decentralization of custody. So I'm sure Renvium is certainly excited about more advancements in that, that aspect of that cryptography. And basically every exchange out there should be rethinking the security model. If they want to remain relevant going forward, they need to go away from this closed source black box of security and move to something that's open and audible and transparent. They need to eschew limit order books. The order books are dead. Going forward, it's going to be liquidity pools. Kyber Network recognizes this, RenVM recognizes this, and so do the ThorChain team. Liquidity pools solve all the problems of, of bringing together liquidity providers, people who need liquidity, and people who can ma maintain liquidity. The incentives are clear and transparent. So we're looking forward to the next five to 10 years of bringing out decentralization, proper decentralization, and get rid of these MySQL databases, IOU tokens, and dudes running around with two out of three multisigs. Yeah, definitely agree with JP. I think, yeah, um, order books are dead. Liquidity pools are, are the future, definitely. <clears throat> and I guess uh, that sort of uh, brings me to, to the very relevant uh, next question of uh, what are the, um, so you guys being the, uh, being the builders uh, in this, uh, what, what are the current, uh, the biggest challenges uh, to, uh, to interoperability right now? Whether it's either bringing BCT specifically or or interoperability as a, as a concept or as a, as a goal. Yeah, I can just jump in from a pragmatic perspective, and I'm you know I'm not terribly technical, but but from observing our tech team, it's really just managing the node infrastructure for all these various chains, like keeping everything up to date, making sure you know if there's an update on the Zcash side of things that it reflects in our system and just making sure everything uh, is maintained. Uh, so there, there's quite a bit of overhead, uh, the more chains you add. Um, and you know, the, the, the longer tail assets you start adding, the, the node infrastructure really isn't as robust as Bitcoin, you know, so you have to put in a lot of extra work and a lot of steps um, to make it all come together and, and have a smooth user experience. Um, so that's something that, that I've noticed, at least from our side. Got it. Got it. Anyone else? Maybe uh, I can any... just, um, yeah, maybe I can say like looking at it from a non-technical perspective, because I think on the technical side, everything can be built. I mean, we have so many different flavors of this technology that I'm sure one of them fits someone's need, you know, but the problem I see is the overall demand for interoperability. Like right now we've talked about Bitcoin quite a number of times and it makes sense to bring Bitcoin on to Ethereum's DeFi. But when you look at the other different, like dozens of, let's say, Ethereum killers, do any of them need their token to be in DeFi? Or, or is there any demand for that token? Because originally there are supposed to be utility tokens on that network, right? So suddenly you're saying, okay, it's not a utility token. 
I'm locking it up in something like Binance Chain, for example, and then I'm issuing it on Ethereum. I mean, I think the challenge is whether the demand is actually there, you know, either in one, two, three years' time. Is there going to be enough adoption in those different blockchains to warrant all this, you know, investment in interoperability? But I mean, technically, I'm all for it, of course. I think it should be that we should be experimenting in that. I agree with Michael that we have immature node infrastructure, which is an important thing. But additionally, it's the user experience. So like today, we still don't have a MetaMask for Bitcoin. Like where, where, I mean, there is dual Chrome extension, but we need to improve the user experience and accessibility all around. Uh, the last thing is uh, the, the problem, the technology. Um, but the, t the Thorchain team at least feel that those, those problems are being solved. Um, we have now you know, potentially one round TSS, which is going to massively improve um, threshold signatures, uh, which is going to be a game changer. But also um, economic engineering and our understanding of economics. Uh, so RenVM have a very interesting way of securing, uh, uh, proposed method of securing uh, the Bitcoin locked in the distributed custodians by coupling it with the uh, minting and the minting fees uh, for Ren. Uh, the Thorchain team also tackled the same problem by basically requiring uh, that all uh, secured assets in the pools are coupled with the runes staked in those pools. So there's a coupled security, liquidity security model. Um, but I guess we need to wait for these, these uh, experiments to hit mainnet and to be tested in the wild for that, that feedback loop of 12 to 18 months for everyone to realize, hey, this is the correct way of doing it. You know, we're 15 months post Uniswap being launched. Um, I was there in, uh, when Hayden Adams launched it um, in DevCon 4. And I guess the entire DeFi community now recognize that a model like Uniswap 1 works, it solves the incentives, and Uniswap blazed the pathway to show that liquidity pools are the future. So I guess we needed more projects like Kyber and RenVM to blast, blast the pathway and show that, hey, you can do it with distributed custodians, you can do it with a couple of liquidity security model, et cetera, et cetera. And soon, I guess, in the next few years, we can, we can move on from these MySQL databases. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And uh, I guess, so Dennis was, uh, I guess, more, spe uh, more specifically sort of, um, uh, and was like the next question, which is, or the next topic is like, what is, what is something that, uh, that people should, in your opinion, should be speaking about uh, more in, in DeFi? So sort of, uh, but, but it isn't spoken about as much as it should, the sort of um, elephant in the room uh, per se. I mean, there was something I was going on about throughout 2019 when everyone was super excited about DeFi. And I kept saying, the interest you get for an asset reflects the risk that you're taking at the end of the day, right? And I think we have a fundamental misjudgment of that risk because we're not considering smart contract risk, platform risk. Many other kinds of risks are not reflecting it. And we're getting systems where you can get like, half a percent on your return. Imagine looking up, let's say a million dollars for half a percent on DeFi when you can go get a government treasury bond. So last year I kept talking about the smart contract risk. And for some reason we didn't have too many issues in 2019, but finally it happened in 2020 where some of these smart contracts turned out to have basic bugs in them or under stress test kind of failed. So people lost their money for not much uh, return. So I think one of the elephants in the room was that, you know, things need to be checked much better, especially when you're connecting different kind of systems together, different DeFi dApps together. And now you're connecting like across from, from Bitcoin to the project you guys are building to Ethereum. It's getting even messier and messier. And so we have to be double secure that everything is working correctly. You know, or this everything like shouldn't be compromised in that sense when we're building such complex uh, systems. Yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely echo what, what, what Dennis said and that, that was actually my answer as well. Um, yeah, like I have a r high risk appetite. I mean, I, I think everyone in this space has a high risk appetite, right? And I still am a little nervous of like <laughs> money in certain places because, you know, I mean, I've lost money as have many of others, uh, you know, just due to all these kind of recent recent hacks and various issues. So, so yeah, I, 
I don't know what this will look like and you kind of want to stay away from like a credentialing body, but, but an association that would kind of maybe fund or support kind of organ or excuse me, DeFi wide um, audits where you can apply or something like that. Um, I'd like to see some standardized standardization of that, um, you know, from a third party neutral organization. I think that would really kind of benefit the space not, not a lobbying group per se, but just a, a, an association, you know, all um, kind of professions have associations, right, that, that lobby for its, its um, growth and, and safety, you know, consumer protection, you add all these things in there. Um, so I know it's a little, a little um, long winded, but I think something like that in, in the next two or three years, I think would really help um, with the consumer protection side of things. And, and safety, of course, as well. <clears throat> Definitely one of the uh, one of the things that uh, I've I've noticed from uh, in terms of when uh, like Dennis mentioned that uh, this year has been this sort of uh, there's been quite quite a few sort of uh, smart contracts for example risks have become apparent and so on but one of the things which I've noticed uh, uh, within the sort of uh, ver within the DeFi community is that the user per perception generally tends to be is that once mainnet launches, then it's kind of, everyone assumes there to be these sort of like massive strides or leaps that like once mainnet launches, then it, that means that like, you know, now I can go all in on this, this, is, this thing is going to, you know, withstand uh, anything. Whereas in reality, actually it should be like a, the sort of the mindset should be a much more sort of, you know, a linear pro a process of gradually sort of, gradually sort of, you know, testing, uh, testing it and over time building out this confidence versus uh versus how the sort of uh, the consumer mindset seems to be that if there's a if there's a big hack then uh then oh no i'm I don't, i'm not sure if i can put my money into this that, like you know it's it's still like you know the testing phase right like some of these protocols which have you know for example it's been it's been out for three months and and then there is a there's an event that, you know there's a such an extremely negative event and then everyone sort of for some reason now goes to the other end of the extreme and kind of, kind of for some reason, like completely writes it off, which, uh, which is just, uh, in my opinion, it's not really the sort of, uh, the, it's not the best way ahead. Yeah. The two elephants in the room, what one would be um, centralized custodians. So getting back to wrap tokens, um, you know, WBTC or TBTC, one, you know, we talk about smart contract risk, but we can also talk, talk about custodial risk is, do people who own these assets know um, the method of redemption and the, you know, how that asset is wrapped and managed? And you can, instead of trading for Bitcoin tokens on, on a bit Binance exchange or a BitMEX exchange, you are replacing them with a BitGo's multi-sigs and BitGo's security models, um, as an example. I'm really keen to see RenVM launch in the wild uh, because I think RenVM is, is a very credible attempt at decentralizing custodial for um, Bitcoin. Uh, so I really hope that project goes off with success. Success, because I think RenVM's Bitcoin offering will be more decentralized than the other ones that are currently out there. The second elephant in the room is, and I've noticed this in the last few months, ever since uh, Uniswap started being sandwich attacks, which was a known attack vector for over nine months now. Um, uni, uh, the Uniswap devs acknowledge the sandwich attack vector um, over nine months ago as a Uniswap GitHub issue, uh, talking about price feeds. Uh, but everyone's is you know quickly abandoning Uniswap's price feeds because you know it's price feeds are the Achilles heel for Uniswap v1, not so much for Uniswap v2. But the problem is everyone is now relying too much on Chainlink oracles. They hear everything from Binance um, chain devs right through to you know the the next compound or the next maker DAO talking about or even synthetics talking about Chainlink oracles. But you know now we've got this problem with Chainlink security model. Does anyone actually know um, you know the 350 million? link tokens that will be used as chain nodes and, and how that actually works. And, you know, is, are there any uh, centralized risk with chain link now? And is, is chain link gearing itself up for systematic risk? Could uh, chain link, you know, there's nothing too big to fail in crypto because there's no one ready to bail you out. But if, if everyone's relying on chain link and there's a fundamental problem with chain link, then that's going to be a problem. So I think we need to, we'll look at more other price, price feeds. Um, hopefully Unisop V2's time weighted average price feed is sufficient for the next wave of DeFi. Um, and excited to see what happens. So speaking of the um, the next wave of uh, DeFi, um, the next kind of uh, pretty open-ended question, but, but is uh, 
who do you think will be the sort of uh, it's still I, and I completely understand it's a very uh, it, it's a, it's a technology and it's very early early stage and but who do you think will be the uh, the first real users of of DeFi? So uh, let's say let's if, if we let's call them the first sort of non speculators uh, of DeFi. Who would you guys sort of um, if you were to speculate who they would be? I would say that the first, the first large set of users who need to embrace DeFi quickly and who will, as soon as one is available, are the millions of people that use the Coinbase's, the Binance's, and the BitMEX of the world need to ditch those that infrastructure and move to something that's decentralized. Uh, the Coinbase's, the Binance, the BitMEX of the world have too much of a grasp. I mean, the 12th of March, Black Thursday, was single-handedly caused by BitMEX's order books um, collapsing in on themselves. And if it wasn't for Arthur's hand, to, to come in and you know pull the circuit breaker then you know it could have gone a lot worse on that day um, you know binance is setting up to be a systematic systematic risk uh, systemic risk uh, coinbase for, for many years have been um, running their own agenda brian armstrong has has a very unique view of the world and once again coinbase have the most users especially in the united states so there's problems there and those problems can be solved with incentives um, Forget about the security improvements or the scalability improvements. Let's talk about the incentives. If you if your DeFi application can can deliver much better incentives than the Coinbase's than the BitMEX of the world, then you then the users will go there. So that, that's who I think the largest set of users should be and will be. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough call. I mean, I, I'd say just, you know, kind of our demographic, but expanded a bit, right? I mean, if, if and as, as JP was, was mentioning, you know, it's, it's really about return and, and, you know, it's maybe a rather basic view of things, but if you can provide five or 6% on a money market account, you know, you know, through Coinbase, you know, via, via Curve or some other mechanism, um, you know, staking a liquidity pool or whatever it is, I think at the end of the day, if you're providing uh, a higher return with lower risk that just simply attracts people, you know, and uh, you know, whether that's bringing people over from wall street or whatever it may be. I think at the end of the day, if you can do that with a good user experience, that will really kind of be the catalyst for, for the next wave in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I mean, anyone who needs to store value right now, if you look at the alternatives, I mean, the, the, the fed is printing trillions of dollars. So in, in terms of return on your investment, like just being liquid is is not a very good option. If you look at equities, there's there's different risks there. Are they overpriced, underpriced? How much are they going to return? So I, th I think crypto is becoming a very viable um, solution. I mean, if you want fixed income at 3% or 5%, I'm sure you can build something exactly tailored to your risk, to your needs. With the right risk profile, you can get, you can take out insurance, for, for example. You can make it almost as good copy as the financial world, you know, especially now with synthetic assets, you know, not, not synthetic specifically, but just in general, like assets that um, represent real assets. I think that's going to be huge once you can put it into the pipeline that is DeFi and do all sorts of crazy stuff in a permissionless, decentralized manner where you are liable for your own tokens. You know, we keep saying not your tokens, you know, not your keys, not your tokens. But I mean, that's, that's how it is going to be. In the future, we're going to, gradually we're expanding the net of people that are kind of coming into this space. From from what I see, they're interested in DeFi. They're interested in the main benefits. They can see like the interoperability is coming in a few years as well. That's going to connect all these different silos. So I think the future is exciting. Although it's hard to say like if any one demographic is going to be pulled in immediately. Definitely, definitely. Uh, speaking of the uh, the future. So um, let's uh, take a sort of um, a, a slightly different uh, direction now. What would each one of yours uh, sort of 30-second um, take on ETH 2.0 uh, be? Um, we can start in, uh, in whatever order. I mean, I, I can just simply say I'm super excited by it. I think it's incredibly promising. And I love how we were started on proof of work. We kind of built up this whole ecosystem. We, we saw that there was demand for it. It was worth building on, on top of like building the next stage. And we have amazing people working on it. There's dozens of teams and they're all super smart and they're all focused on their own different areas from clients to the actual mechanics and the economy side of it. 
but on the other hand, it's super risky as well, you know, in terms of how it's going to work out. I think it's going to work out, but of course, you never know. It's a huge switch. And then the whole concept that we're going to be using different shards, cross-shard communication. There's, there's quite a few still unanswered questions in terms of what the current DeFi ecosystem is going to look like on ETH 2.0. But overall, I'm, I'm optimistic the people working on it are going to be able to solve it. Was that over 30 seconds? Uh, I don't know. Let's say more or less. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, JP? Again, or Michael, go ahead. I, uh, I echo exactly what, what, what Dennis said. Um, you know, there, there's obviously some risk involved, but if it does work out, you know, again, you know, for the end user, it's, it's going to be better. It's going to be, you know, faster, you know, at the end of the day. So that's, that's really all they care about. Um, so I think it's definitely a positive move. Yep. The, the risks of Earth 2.0 is one, it's going to be a contentious fork. Uh, there will be a POW chain remaining that will, who knows, half of DeFi might go to Earth 2.0 for, for the scalability reasons. The other half might stay because of the security. Proof of stake, um, especially a proof of stake like Earth 2.0 where exchanges can can run campaigns and accumulate vast sums of capital without actually paying for it that challenges the security model because the security model is that capital has a cost you know in, in proof of work work has a cost in proof of stake it's supposed that capital has a cost but exchanges that can accumulate and signal and market and gather vast amounts of capital without paying for it by by promising to pay a marginal uh, rate of return of over and above or reducing some form of something else like abstracting or reducing risk. Uh, they can access all this capital without uh, paying for it. And then that inevitably results in centralization and, and ends up in, in the direction, direction like EOS ends up. Now, the second thing is um, the problem with uh, an on-chain random beacon. And I mean, the model for a verifiable VRF, so verifiably random function um, with the beacon chain idea, uh, that inc incidentally requires an ASIC. Uh, so, you know, Ethereum and Filecoin are putting together $40 million to build out that ASIC and you need a thousand people around the world to mine the VRF, the beacon chain. But again, so it's going to be the high, it's not going to be pure proof of stake because you have a hybrid proof of work ASIC chain and also a proof of stake chain that exchanges are going to, uh, you know, suck in and control their power. So we're stuck in F2.0 is huge risk. Um, it's, it is the elephant in the room. I'm, I'm a little bit dubious as to it's uh, pulling it off. I think it will, something will happen. Uh, will it go, blow up with a bang? Who knows? Um, in five years time, if it was just ended up like another EOS or, it, or there was an attack vector on the random beacon chain and end up back being a proof of work chain because um, now so, suddenly everyone realized that you can manipulate the random beacon function just by committing more ASICs downrange to the VRF. So, you know, the, the holy grail of proof of stake chain might end up back coming back to being a proof of work chain. You never know. So, there's lots of unknowns. Um, I wouldn't bet on Ethereum 2.0. I'm just an observer. Although you're a pessimistic observer from the sounds of it, you know. Uh, although I don't think there's going to be a like conscientious, uh, well, conscientious um, fork. I mean, ETH 2.0 is going to start and ETH 1.0 is going to carry on chugging along. And if you want to use ETH 2.0, like in the, in the second phase, you can use that. And at some point, ETH 1.0 is going to be rolled up in it. I don't think there's any risk of any split of the ecosystem in terms of uh, at a high level i guess I don't, I don't see that risk and in terms of exchanges i mean if this had been the first year of ethereum and everything was let's say on a couple of exchanges okay but right now the ecosystem is so diversified that i don't think anyone's any single entity is hoarding enough ethereum to be able to impact it i mean from the numbers i've seen I haven't really seen this as something like that is in the top three, for example, challenges that we're going to face, you know, that we have too much centralization. Because even if there was something that, what, even if one of them tried to do something, 30, 40% collected, the others would just split off and they would lose their balance. So it's very, in terms of game theory, I think it's just as sound as anything that's available in proof of work. Yeah, I disagree. It does definitely will be a contentious hard fork. I mean, it's easy to see that the people who reject the proof of stake security model will just uh, decouple themselves from the from allowing well, can, the change. They to can use ETC. I mean, anyone yeah, who wants ETC to say proof of work has ETC though. That's correct, but uh, Ethereum Classic is 
never really got the DeFi adoption. Who knows? Ethereum Classic might be um, the gravity well for proof of work um, with a tier, partially Turing complete um, language like the EVM. Now, I mean, and you're right um, in the sense that exchanges will heavily campaign for ETH 2.0 because they have a lot of ETH from their users that they want to be, that today is not productive, that with ETH 2.0 will be productive as in earn a return on. So they will be heavily campaigning for the ETH 2.0. So might, because of that and all the exchanges pushing for ETH 2.0 because it's for their own financial interest, it could go off semi-smoothly, but then in the long term, will it be de truly decentralized? Yeah. That is Although, the I mean, who, who, who do you think is against the ETH 2.0 within the DeFi community? Because, I mean, I, they, I don't know. I don't think they've been too vocal about it, if, if that's the case. Yeah, sure. So th there's lots of unanswered questions to do with uh, the security model. Is it, does, is it secure? Does it, does it, is it vulnerable to collusion attacks and, and whatnot? We, we're yet to see some, some proper test nets pull up and for people to, to try and attack it. Um, it's still quite theoretical. So you never know over the next few years, there could be a growing um, group of people who want to dissent against uh, the proof of stake direction. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Okay. Speaking of uh, the sort of the next uh, few years, so because uh, this uh, this panel we uh, we're doing it for uh, for the conference Reimagine 2020, which is uh, quite heavily student focused as well. So, what would uh, the uh, what would, what advice would you give today to uh, to potential students? So, starting from CS as well as business and finance and lawyers and so on that are looking at a career in uh, blockchain or cryptocurrency. What would be be the sort of um, the short uh, advice that you would give them, because we we have about ten more minutes left, and uh, and a couple of or, or quite a few sort of uh, community questions, which uh, which I think will get some spice uh, to uh, sp spicy debates as well. Yeah, I mean, my, mine's pretty simple. It's just honestly be as proactive as, as you can. Just join a community. You know, it really doesn't matter what what your major is or, or core focus. Just you know, join a community, get involved. And, and if you do good work and continue to contribute to a community, you'll be recognized. And, and in this space in particular, if you show ambition, you, you will rise to the top. You know, if you have that, that drive to learn and really figure out the space, then you can, you know, start your own, you know, obviously everything is permissionless, right? So you can go and start your own Uniswap if you want. I mean, it, it is really at the end of the day, um, about being ambitious. And, and I think this space is very well suited for, the, for that type of personality. Um, so yeah, that, that's my advice. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with Michael and I'll just add, like ignore the charts and the prices and trying to do technical analysis that doesn't add any value to either the, even the space or like to your own development because trading has been happening for so many years and it's so much competition, that's not what's, amazing about what we're doing here and i have so many friends who started at the same time in 2016 and they just got focused on the charts four years later we're at very different places you know and that, for me it's been so enjoyable learning about the technology so my advice would be just ignore the price stuff and just learn about the technology learn about blockchains and then you just get sucked into it anyway yeah it's pretty clear that the future is being able to talk to computers and the quicker you're able to realize this and get into software engineering or some sort of uh, be technical, I actually don't think it's any longer any excuse for someone to say they're not technical. Everyone should be technical. Everyone should know how to talk to computers. As a basic minimum, you should be able to spot up a smart contract in Ethereum and deploy it. Ethereum has got this wonderful characteristics where it's basically serverless. You can deploy a smart contract, verify your code on, on Etherscan and ship a small React based front end or you, you know, Savelt JS and straight away have people interacting with the smart contract, paying real money and, and moving funds around. Obviously the next stage is, is set some kind of cap on how much funds and the liability you expose yourself to, uh, but then ultimately audit it and, and go from there. I mean, but yeah, it's Ethereum is community so easy to build something in a weekend and ship that and have funds going on a Monday morning. Um, but post Ethereum, if you want to build more powerful stuff, then probably go laying on Python and really uh, dig deep into kind of more of the blockchain stuff. I would say you need bread and butter should be knowing how the primitives work, knowing how EC pairs and key pairs and being able to sign transactions for Ethereum, Bitcoin or Binance chain or whatever. You should know these primitives and know these basics, be able to spool up any form of wallet um, at, at a moment's notice. And from there, you give yourself tools to build whatever, um, whatever you, your ambitions set yourself to as Michael said. 
Thank you. I think excellent uh, advice, and I uh, and I hope uh, as many people as possible uh, take it as well. So um, now, before we get to the uh, get to the Q and A part, uh, just a sort of uh, a last kind of um, uh, wild question: What is the sort of uh, to each one of you? What is the biggest misconception uh, about your project that you just uh, wish people would finally understand? Anyone want to go first or? Go ahead, Dan. Um, I mean, for Kyber Network, sometimes a misconception is that we're just an exchange, but KyberSwap is the exchange. We're much, much more than an exchange. We aggregate liquidity and we push it downstream. So maybe that's just one misconception. If you've heard of Kyber, it's not just like a Uniswap where you just exchange and, and that's it. There's so much more that's happening behind the scenes. You know, in DeFi, it's being used to build margin trades within one transaction by buying, selling, collateralizing, and repeating that as well. So there's a lot to it. And if anyone wants to find out more, they can just join our Telegram. Mm -hmm. JP? Yeah, one of, one of the misconceptions I notice um, looking at the community is, is ThorChain is not reliant on any other chain. It's completely chain agnostic. Uh, so no matter which chain it chooses to, to launch with, Binance, Chain, Ethereum, Bitcoin, Monero, whatever, it's chain agnostic. It's a self-sovereign blockchain with its own nodes starting at 12, going to 100 uh, that will observe those chains no matter what they are. And additionally, ThorChain is ability to what they uh, the team call Ragnarok, which is a Norse word, um, the Great War. Basically, a Ragnarok is is snipping ties with the chain. So if a chain, you know, a client, you know, hard forks, contentious or otherwise causes a chain to become disrupted, then the, the ThorChain can just Ragnarok that chain, refund all the assets, and then move on with life. So it's not dependent, and it's not uh, stuck with any chain or any asset. It's quite a, quite agnostic. Yeah, I'd say ours is kind of in the same vein, just, just from a communications perspective. I mean, RenVM can do so many things. It's really hard to articulate that in a very concise way that the community can understand. Like, what RenVM can do today is, is one thing, right? We're bringing Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash and Zcash to Ethereum. That's very clear, but what it can do in a year's time is, is very, very much different from that. You know, we can bring, you know, Libra to Ethereum or Libra to Tezos or something like that. I mean, it, it, it so from our perspective, it is, I mean, not, not from our perspective, but it is very much chain agnostic as well. So finding that concise kind of narrative is, has always been tricky. Um, so that's something we, we, you know, we kind of struggle with, but, uh, but I think we're getting there. So, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully we clear that up, but, uh, thanks guys. <clears throat> got it. Got it. All right. We, um, we're almost at the end. I'm going to, let's try to do this Q and as fast as possible. So, uh, so, uh, so let's try to do a sort of a uh, quick fire. So what, uh, for the first question is, uh, so everyone is, so, um, everyone's so excited about bringing BTC to ETH, but, what are the risks of bringing BTC to uh, to the ETH ecosystem? Well, you're compounding risk, and, and our CTO long always speaks to this, right? You've got Bitcoin chain risk, Ethereum chain risk, and now you have a third additional risk. So that's either RenVM, TBTC, WBTC, whoever, whatever the custodial mechanism is. That's a third, you know, a, a third mm -hmm. component of, of risk. So. You know, the safest place to have Bitcoin is always on the Bitcoin chain, right? Um, so by bringing all these other assets to Ethereum, you're, you're essentially compounding risk. And, you know, I think as we all all noted, um, that really increases the need um, for safety in the, in the space and, and, and really focusing on that to ensure uh, consumer protection. So, yeah. Any, any uh, other risks to add to? Um, Michael got them all. It's your compa companion risk. And as he said, the the only time you get to hold Bitcoin is when you hold layer one Bitcoin. Everything else is just an IOU or a promise. Um, and it's just a matter of shifting the de uh, shifting that trust around. Yeah. And maybe just to add, there might be some tax implications as well. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Um, next question. What will it take for Bitcoin traders to be confident enough about DeFi solutions to move a good amount of their trading activities to DEXs rather than centralized exchanges? 
Okay. My answer to that, sorry, would be just that Kyber has done over a billion dollars worth of trading since it's launched. Uniswap's done ton, 0x. There's so many have, that have done exchange so much and it's gradually, you can start trusting more over time just because it's not being hacked in the meantime on, the, on some projects at least. Yeah, I agree. I mean, just just you know, trader user experience, of course, is is number one. But you know, again, I'll, I'll go back to to my kind of basic view of the world. That you know, if the returns are better, if I can you know go use my Bitcoin on, in DeFi and get better returns, then there absolutely will be demand for that. So I think that's a uh, another key component. So if DeFi can provide that, which I think we're all working on that right now, um, then that'll help bring a, a good portion of that population over. Yeah, I mean, most of the volume today is either arbitrage volume of Bitcoin in and out of your CT or um, degenerate gamblers betting on the price of Bitcoin going up or down and trying to 100x FOMO along something. Uh, so once a infrastructure, I mean, BitMEX has been the king for so long, um, but, you know, we've got Deribit and a few others popping up, try and challenge that. Um, this is necessary and it's a good thing uh, because we can't have another 12th, 12th of March go down again. And even even the last few years, there's been numerous times where Bitmax has been a systemic risk to the price of Bitcoin and its and its stability as as an asset. So we need to move on from that, and uh, there need to be alternatives that have better incentives, better liquidity, better transparency, and actually reduce risk, um, custodial risk. Because yeah, um, you can trust that CZ is going to look after Bitcoin or Arthur Hayes is going to look after Bitcoin on on those exchanges. Um, but are you going to trust the Ren VM to look after Bitcoin? Are you going to trust the Nodes to Stock of your Bitcoin, uh, you're going to have to inspect it for yourself and, and, and it's going to have to be tested, you know, 12, 18, 24 months. Who knows how long before it takes to get meaningful volume in because the trust has to be there. These days, Uniswap is, has decent liquidity. It's got $40 million locked up the last time I checked. So it's decent liquidity, but that took 15 months. Um, so I think it's going to be sim similar journey for these other projects. Okay. Uh, next question. What's the... Um... And this, I think, is actually a pretty interesting one. Uh, and it, I think Dennis needs to it as well. What's the second connection after ETH, BTC, and how to assess it? Is it just market cap based or volume based, and how to look at it? I guess it's more toward, direct towards uh, towards rent, the most. Could you repeat that? Sorry. Uh, what What would the second uh, kind of uh, so what What's the second question? Uh, a connection after ETH BTC and how to assess it. So essentially, br uh, would it be bring EOS uh, into DeFi, bring uh, Bitcoin Cash, and what, what would the sort of, what would the best metric uh, be for this? Right. The sort of uh, speculation, economic activity, or? Uh... Yeah, our, our, our kind of guiding light in, in this vein is, uh, is liquidity, right? I mean, and, and that, you know, that's pretty easy to determine. You know, there's Bitcoin first and foremost, and then you know we'll just start adding. You know, the highest liquidity um, digital assets that make sense to Ethereum, right? And then, and then this is my my personal opinion, but uh, I think Ethereum is is obviously here to stay, so we'll likely focus on that. But if for some reason some other layer one, you know, smart contracting platform comes up, Polkadot or, or whatever it is, um, then then we'll pivot to that as needed. Um, but I don't think that'll that'll happen in the immediate term. But yeah, li liquidity is our, our guiding light for for adding um, new assets to RenVM. Got it. Not just got liquidity, it. but also um, sense, sense, it has to be censorship resistance as well, because you can't go ahead and connect your chain up RenVM to Ripple and for all of a sudden to, you know, Chris to suddenly censor your Ripple tokens off you and suddenly RenVM is insolvent. Uh, the right. same thing can be said with Thorchain. It's it's censorship resistance. So to know that once you observe those assets going in, nobody can freeze them and take them off you because you need the availability of those assets, no matter, matter, no matter the nature of the transaction, to ensure solvency at all time. Um, so chains that both improve solvency in that regard and, and improve that, um, you know, essentially resistance. So king of script, Litecoin is a high contender. Um, king of um, GPU, uh, Monero is also high contender. The interesting thing about Monero is and this is something that most traders would love to access is the ability to snip chain analysis dead in the track by just doing a single Monero transaction because you, you can access the entire Monero anonymity set with one transaction. Whereas with Bitcoin, it's, it's very difficult until we get Schnorr to access um, higher anonymity sets. So King of Script, Litecoin is quite essentially resistant. Um, Ethereum, Monero, um, 
wouldn't wouldn't touch Ripple with a ten foot pole because it can be censored. Wouldn't touch Libra because it can be censored. Any other like central bank digital currency, they can all be censored. Um, Tom blockchain is an interesting one. That thing will get launched at some point in the future. Pavel Durov is notoriously anti-state, and this little dance he's having with the SEC is just something temporary. Uh, but Ton will get launched, and it's quite interesting to see the growth of the Ton community. So I think the Ton blockchain is going to be quite a big thing going to the future. Polkadot, uh, yeah, I mean Polkadot's an interesting project. The problem in they is they they are well they are directly again uh, competing with F2.0, and I, I just think F2.0 is you know it's slower to innovate than Polkadot. Some of the Polkadot stuff coming out is is A class, it's incredible engineering. But what they don't have is is that kind of mind share. Uh, they've got amazing engineers, but they don't have mindshare. At Tupano, it's a little bit sloppy, but it's got incredible mindshare. Uh, sorry, just a question on what you were previously saying. So who decides on ThorChain what gets kind of connected or not? So the I team will, you wouldn't will list uh, Ripples. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so ease of connection and, and the no threat of it being, you know, censored, um, forked off or anything contentious that could cause disruption to the, the soft connection. Uh, but ultimately, the, the developers will propose modules um, that are built to interface between that external chain and Thor chain, and nodes get to choose. So Thor nodes have committed the capital, they're running the system, they get churned in and out regularly, so they can make frequent decisions um, into what modules to run and what chains to support, and they can signal that in order to support external chains. So, so you could see Ripple on ship Thor chain, ship software. You could see Ripple on Thor chain that would require um, an enterprise developer to ship the module, and for most of the Thor nodes, I think it's a good idea. Uh, but those Thor nodes are going to have to be ready to, because Thor, the, if something goes wrong in ThorChain and there's problem like, you know, a double spend, um, not attack, but a double spend, um, uh, or malicious reorg rather, because so there's Bitcoin can never be double spent, but can be malicious reorged, um, or if Ripple gets censored, then there's going to be a solvency problem. And in ThorChain, ThorChain socializes that loss uh, to people staking assets. Um, which ultimately hurt the nodes and their capital. Uh, so yeah, that's how it works. Okay, yeah, got it. So speaking of, there is a, there's mention of, uh, of Monero. So we have a question to, uh, to Rune and Bren, uh, and then a uh, connecting question to Fibers. So how soon can, uh, can uh, we expect to see Monero available as a, as a supported asset on Byren or, uh, or ThorChain? As quickly as possible. Monero has some amazing characteristics and the team are ready to support it as soon as, the, as soon as they've done the work. The main problem with Monero for adding it is it's, an, it's not a SEC K256 um, key pair. So you can't use your Bitcoin keys or your Ethereum keys. Um, it's an ED25519 key pair. Um, you can use the same private key, but you've got to regenerate the public key and the address. Um, but it's possible to solve it. And I'm pretty sure that the SSF triple S scheme that Ren VM using is um, ED255 run compatible, it certainly is the case for ThorChain TSS. So as soon as possible was the answer. Uh, we're looking forward to that. <laughs> Once the work's done, <laughs> well, you got to do the work. Yeah, I, I'd agree with JP. I mean, there, there are some technical challenges with, with Monero specifically. I mean, we're, we're big fans of it, of course. Um, our, our core focus in the immediate term is Zcash and, and making sure we can get shielded addresses working within RenVM as well. Um, but then we'll, we'll turn our heads to, to others in the space and more specifically Monero. So um, soon, but, but not that soon, I guess is the answer. Yeah. Yeah. The, and For the us, second part of the question guys... actually is, uh, was actually directed towards Kyber that would Kyber uh, be listing? Uh, can, uh, can the community expect Kyber to list the uh, uh, rough Monero uh, when yeah, it's I mean, uh, available? Yeah, I mean, I was just add, add, going to add that whenever it's available, there's no reason why we shouldn't. I mean, it's a decentralized exchange. You can go and you can list it there. You know, if it's there, it's there mm -hmm. to be used. It's not really for me to decide. It, it would be nice to have, of course. Got it. Um, another question that I took was right, uh, Kyber. Is, is Kyber planning for, uh, for, a, for a natively cross-chain uh, future as well in some, frame, uh, in some form? Um, we actually looked into it like uh, last year and the year before, and we actually built a bridge with EOS called Waterloo. And we kind of had like this kind of pilot um, kind of thing called YOLO swap over there as well. And we learned a lot from it. It was a great experience, but we didn't see, I don't know, we didn't see organic growth. I mean, the demand wasn't there on the EOS side. So 
and on the, in the meantime, we had DeFi exploding in the Ethereum space. So we said it's so much better if we just keep focusing on Ethereum. And when other teams build out interoperability, we're happy to take it and, you know, run BTC or whatever, we're, you know, it, it'll, it'll work. We don't have to focus on that part because much more focused teams are actually working on that piece anyway. Got it, got it. So, uh, we, all right, we have the uh, last two questions uh, which are unrelated to each other. Um, so, have uh, first one is, uh, have flash loans caused more problems than they've solved? I think we kind flash of- Flash loans is like giving- topic. Yeah, so flash loans is like rocking up to a toddler party and giving all the toddlers an AK-47 <laughs> and seeing who's last one standing. Problem with the good thing about sorry, the bad thing about flash lines is, is just so much collateral damage and it really challenges the, like I said earlier, that capital has a cost. With flash loans, capital doesn't have a cost. The, any, any kid with a script can, can go on and, and brute force exploits in, in just smart contracts all over the ecosystem and DeFi composability works against itself. The good thing about flash loans is that it will make the last one standings, so the last small contract standings will be the most resi resilient, redundant, and you know, guard against reentrancy and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it, we're just gonna have to go through this and get this flash loan period over and done with so we can work out how to defend um, contracts against um, crazy exploits through flash loans, but it's a necessary part. So let's just get over and done with and you know, let's get some more script kitties out there with, with flash loan scripts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, well, actually, I mean, I'm, okay, I'm completely okay with flash loans if the system financially it lets you do that and all the primitives are there and all the Lego money is there for you to be able to do that, then go ahead, experiment. Who am I to say that flash loans shouldn't be used just because this one or two or three, four times they were used to exploit, you know, maybe it's, it's even a benefit that we're plugging or that we're kind of stress testing a system immediately to see where the holes are. Okay, let's give out flash loans and see where the fires are gonna break out. Okay, they're there, so what happened? Let's learn from that. So I see it as a positive thing and I, and I, I think it will be around you know, in the future as well. I'm sure it's gonna have some kind of benefits, but it's just like faster arb trading basically and the system allows it. I think it's, it's, it's a future then. If you know how to use it, then go ahead and use it. And if you're a smart contract writer, we said you should be careful against this kind of stuff anyway. Yeah, agreed. All I, right. I and, sorry, go on, Michael. No, I echo those guys. And, and yeah, I think ultimately it makes the system more robust um, by kind of exposing those attack vectors. So I think it's a good thing. <clears throat> Got it. And now this uh, last one is kind of, uh, I guess, very open again. What's the biggest threat to your respective network? What keeps you up at night? Thorchain community members keep me up at night. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. Uh, now the, the biggest thing is, is someone learning how to factor primes and breaking all of our key pairs. Nah. Um, cryptography, uh, we're, especially in threshold signatures and especially the case for the RenVM team, is we're dealing with new cryptography that we perhaps don't know the, the limits of, and we hope it will keep the assets secure, but one day you might wake up and all the assets are gone because of some weird little crypto trick. That would be bad. Yeah, I, I would agree. Some zero day bug that, that we're just, you know, no one's cognizant of at, at this point, um, you know, uh, and it causes some issue with, with our tech or someone else's. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something that, that myself and our tech team stays uh, up, up at night with. So um, yeah, I, I, I think that's it on our end. So this is actually a question from, uh, from, uh, from someone from our team. And uh, the, the example they brought was that uh, a lot of the, um, for example, was that the, a, lot, a lot of nodes uh, uh, or sort of uh, <clears throat> prospective nodes would be run on or would be hosted on the cloud. And uh, now, what if not in the sort of uh, near distant future, uh, we start having some forms of, uh, of regulations and how does that impact sort of the, the integrity of the networks when there are these sorts of looming threats of, uh, of essentially uh, certain jurisdictions, you know, kind of changing their policy directions and so on, which in some, which in one way or form is definitely going to come, but now how and how does this sort of get 
under or overreacted to. It was something we kind of um, debated at uh, internally, but we did not have a definitive answer. Yeah, I think it's I think it's about risk mitigation. Um, you have you know you have a variety of VPS providers in a variety of jurisdictions, right? You've got some in the states, but maybe you have some in Iceland as well, which has some some quite uh, strong uh, data privacy laws. Um, and then eventually, and this is you know uh, allowed with RenVM, individuals just can run their own nodes on their own computers. I mean, we use VPSs because it's easy to spin up for the average person. Um, but you know, eventually we'll have you know uh, support for home computers as well. So it's really just spreading the risk out. Um, you know, and if, if you know the, the U.S.-based VPS providers, you know, DigitalOcean, AWS, you know, decide not to like crypto, then there's still you know this all this whole other part of the network that that still suffices. So, and then with RenVM specifically, you know, one third of the network can go completely offline, and everything still remains uh, fine. So, so that's a good thing on our end. Any additions? If not, then. Uh... Yeah, it's just about education of your, your node operators that it's it's not good to be jumping on and spooling up a you know a US East kind of AWS instance because that would be bad, um, especially with Silicon Valley being the sanctimonious valley moral arbiters of truth these days, as Elon likes to say. But yeah, that's really it. I think that's a wrap. All right. Thank you so much, uh, guys, for uh, for taking the time and participating. We uh, and especially being um, uh, some of the uh, those plethora of time zones we've uh, we managed to uh, to cross here, and uh, and definitely a lot of uh, interesting uh, conversations and a lot learned. And uh, thank you so much again, guys. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you, guys. Cheers, thank you. Bye. Bye. Stay tuned to learn more about the state of blockchain education at major universities all around the world. Reimagine 2020.